today we are looking at a case from the end of the 19th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. At the end of the 19th century, industry was rapidly expanding throughout the United States of America. Some states, however, such as Indiana, still had a very large farming community. In the 1890s, Indiana had 22 million acres of farmland, growing many different crops, including corn, wheat, oats, barley, rye, sweet potatoes and tobacco. Like much of the American Midwest, Indiana's exports remained largely linked to agriculture until the 1920s. Frederick Shanks had a farm on the very edge of Fountain County in Indiana. He lived there with his wife and six children and was considered to be a hard-working man. Opposite lived Mr. Dan Keller and his wife named Nanny. Mr. Keller was 28 years old and also had a farm, but his was just across the county line in Park County, Indiana. The two families had always got on as neighbours and had never had any reason to quarrel. Since 1890, the American Midwest had suffered from a lack of rainfall. This was compounded by the fact that since the introduction of the railroads, many people had settled in states such as Indiana, Iowa, Kansas and Minnesota. Many had done so with unrealistic expectations of the productivity of the land. The amount of land required to support a family in the more arid regions was already larger than the amount that could realistically be irrigated by a family. But this fact was made more obvious during the dry periods. And in the summer of 1895, Indiana was suffering another drought. This meant that Mr. Shanks had to get water from Mr. Keller's property. This was not an issue. The farmers would always help each other. And Mr. and Mrs. Keller did not object to Mr. Shanks walking through their yard in order to fetch water. Mr. Shanks, however, did not do this himself and instead gave the task to his 18-year-old daughter, Clara. She was known in the neighbourhoods to be a particularly beautiful young lady and young men would notice her wherever she went. As Clara continued to fetch the water, Mrs. Keller started to get quite concerned. She did not really want such an attractive young lady continuously walking across her yard. She noticed that her husband, Mr. Dan Keller, would often stop and talk to young Clara. Of course, Clara would reply. After all, she was a polite girl and she knew that the Kellers did not have to let them cross their property in order to get water. Mrs. Nanny Keller, however, did not see it that way. Instead, she believed that Clara was deliberately flirting with her husband and was intent in trying to seduce him. Clara's two younger brothers would often see Mr. Keller working in his yard and whenever they did, they would shout to Clara, Hey sis, there goes your fella. This only added to Mrs. Keller's suspicion that something was going on between her husband and Clara. By now, quite jealous of the attention that her husband seemed to give the beautiful young 18-year-old, Mrs. Keller started to tell neighbours of her concern and of the inappropriate behaviour of Miss Clara Shanks. Eventually, Clara's elder brother Daniel heard of the allegations. He was surprised as he had always thought his sister to be a polite and well-behaved young lady. He decided to speak to Mrs. Keller. So on the 5th of July, he went to the Keller's house to ask why Mrs. Keller was saying these things about his sister. Mrs. Keller told him that she believed there was something improper going on between Clara and her husband, and that Clara would no longer be permitted to cross their yard to get water. Instead, Daniel Shanks must tell his father to send another family member to fetch it. There was now tension between the two families. So the following morning, Nanny Keller, her husband Dan, and Dan's sister, Miss Margaret Keller, decided that they should go and see Mr. and Mrs. Shanks and try to sort out their differences. After all, they were neighbours. The US economy had been going through a period of recession and things had been made even more difficult due to the droughts. They did not want to make an enemy of Mr. and Mrs. Shanks. The Kellers stood by the rail fence that separated the two properties and called for Clara. However, her brother would not let her come to the door. Eventually, Clara's mother responded and Mrs. Keller told her that she believed that her daughter Clara had been conducting an improper relationship with her husband. Mrs. Shanks replied that she did not think the accusation to be true, but Mrs. Keller then turned to her husband and said, Will you let them deny what I say? 
Dane Keller did not deny any relationship with Clara. Mrs Shanks then went back inside her house and closed the door. At dinner, Clara's father, Mr Frederick Shanks, was told for the first time of the allegation. He asked his daughter if it were true and Clara replied that it was not. There was a strange silence and after a few minutes, Clara got up. She left the table and then left the house. A few hours passed and as Clara had not returned, her mother sent out her other children to look for her. As they walked past the Keller's yards, Dan Keller looked up and shouted, If you are looking for Clara, my wife saw her going down the lane more than an hour ago. The children searched the area known as Wolf Creek and called out for Clara, but they could not find her. Everything seemed very quiet. Then suddenly one of them would call out for their sister again. As it started to get dark, they all returned home. That night, Mrs Shanks had a very disturbing dream. She dreamt that her daughter was struggling in the pool at the foot of Wolf Creek Falls at 5 a.m. and unable to sleep very much. She got up. Her eldest son, Daniel, had also had a troubled night worrying about his sister. Mrs Shanks told him about her dream. They had searched that area the previous day, but not looked by the pool, only in the thicket that surrounded it. Daniel immediately put on his boots and ran to the pool. It was not far from their house, only about half a mile. When he entered the water, he saw his sister. She was lying in about five feet of water. Strangely, however, Daniel made no attempt to pull the lifeless body from the pool. Instead, he went straight back to the house, retrieved his shotgun and marched towards the Keller's property. From their front gate, he shouted, Clara is drowned in Wolf Creek Falls, and you caused it. Dan Keller, seemingly a little tired, came to the door. As he did, Daniel Shanks fired his shotgun twice. Fortunately, both times his shot hit the edge of the doorframe. Dan Keller quickly retreated inside his house. His wife then went outside to plead with Daniel Shanks to stop firing. Fortunately, a neighbour appeared named James Rice. He had heard the commotion and persuaded Daniel Shanks to go home. Soon word spread of the death of young Clara Shanks. Her body was removed from the pool at Wolf Creek and taken back to the home of her parents. Here a post-mortem was performed. Although this was hastily arranged and not conducted in any great detail, the two doctors concluded that Miss Clara Shanks had taken her own life by drowning. The next day, Dan Keller went to the town of Rockville in Park County and in front of Deputy Sheriff McCain, took out a warrant against Daniel Shanks for the unprovoked attack against him and his wife. However, when the Deputy Sheriff went to the Shanks property to serve the warrants, he was met by many men who said that they were representing the citizens of Fountain County. And if the Deputy Sheriff arrested Daniel Shanks, they would hang Dan Keller. The Deputy Sheriff decided that in this instance, he would return to Rockville and would not serve the warrant against Daniel Shanks. The next day, Clara was buried at the Zach Meyer Cemetery. The funeral service was attended by most of the residents who lived in Wolf Creek Valley. By now, tension was running high and not wanting anyone to take the law into their own hands. A meeting was held at the old schoolhouse to decide what should be done. Another meeting was held the following evening. The local people believed that something untoward had happened to young Clara Shanks. So a delegation was sent to petition the authorities to conduct another autopsy. Whilst this was being considered, the police searched the thicket that surrounded Wolf Creek Falls. If Clara had been murdered, they needed to find any comprehensive proof that would support this. There are reports that evidence of a struggle had been found, including an area where a body could possibly have been dragged towards the Wolf Creek Pool. This included a footprint from a man's shoe and some blood on the thicket. Witnesses had also come forward, and although no one had seen Clara in the vicinity of Wolf Creek Pool in the afternoon of Saturday the 6th of July 1895, there was a group of young men who had spent much of the day swimming and bathing by the pool. They informed the authorities that there was no body in the pool during the time that they were there, and that they had seen nothing suspicious. This led the police to conclude that Clara's body was not placed in the Wolf Creek Pool until after midnight and was then discovered the following morning. Everyone seemed to be convinced 
that Dan Keller had had something to do with the death of Clara. Public sentiment had very much turned against him, so feeling somewhat uneasy, he took his family to live with his brother, Mr. George Keller, who lived about two miles from the home of Mr. and Mrs. Shanks. As news of Clara's tragic death spread throughout Fountain and Park counties, people started to descend on Wolf Creek Valley to see the pool where the body was discovered. They would also walk past the homes of Mr. and Mrs. Shanks and Mr. and Mrs. Keller, and as they did, they would theorise as to what exactly happened on the night of the 6th of July. The press were particularly interested in the story. Journalists from various newspapers conducted interviews with both Mr. and Mrs. Shanks and Mr. and Mrs. Keller. However, whatever they thought of each other, neither couple would actually suggest that the other was responsible for the death of Clara. Ten days passed before it was agreed that another autopsy should take place, and this would be carried out by doctors from both Park and Fountain counties. The body had already started to decompose, which made the task quite difficult. Nevertheless, after a thorough investigation, it was confirmed that Miss Clara Shanks had been murdered. Bruises were found on her head, her skull had been fractured, and her neck had been broken, and as no water was found in her larynx or her lungs, the possibility of death by drowning was ruled out. The theory that she took her own life was also dismissed, as the six doctors who examined her declared that on her death, Miss Clara Shanks had no cause to be ashamed, as she had never been intimate with anyone and died a respectable young lady. By the 9th of August, the authorities believed that they had enough evidence to arrest Mr. Dan Keller, his wife, Mrs. Nanny Keller, and his sister, Miss Margaret Keller, all of whom were taken into custody and charged with the murder of Miss Clara Shanks. The police also arrested Dan Keller's brother, and he was charged with being an accessory to murder. The Keller's attorney was quick to counter the opinion that his clients had committed this terrible crime. He circulated the idea that the death of Clara had somehow been caused by her own family. He pointed out just how easily Daniel Shanks had located his sister's body in the early morning of Sunday the 7th of July and said that the apparent dream of Mrs Shanks was too realistic to have come from a sleeping brain. He also reminded the press that Mr and Mrs Keller had told the police that they had seen Daniel Shanks cross the field and walk towards Wolf Creek on two occasions in the afternoon on the day that Miss Clara Shanks went missing. In fact, Mrs Nanny Keller had said that his manner was very suspicious and this was also the opinion of Miss Margaret Keller, with their home now unattended. Their farm was visited by people who wished to take souvenirs from the house where it had been reported a murder had been committed. The Kellers were kept in jail until the day of the trial. The trial began on the 27th of January 1896 and as the case had caused so much publicity in Fountain and Park counties, it took place in the city of Terre Haute in Vigo County. The Kellers were indicted on nine separate charges in order to cover all the different means which could have been used to murder Clara. The prosecution claimed that on Saturday the 6th of July, Clara had gone to the property of Mr and Mrs Keller to confront Mrs Keller and ask her to retract the accusation that she had been intimate with her husband. An altercation took place which resulted in the death of Clara. The Kellers then hid the young girl's body in the kitchen before transporting it to Wolf Creek Falls sometime during the night. The prosecution stated that this was a distance of about half a mile and that Mr. Dan Keller was assisted in this act by his brother, Mr. John Keller. The prosecution added that the Kellers placed the body in Wolf Creek as they wanted everyone to believe that Miss Clara Shanks had taken her own life due to the shame she had brought on herself and her family when the reality was that she was an honest and honorable young lady who had only gone over to Mr. and Mrs. Keller's property that day in order to defend her good name and asked Mr. Keller to tell his wife the truth, which was that nothing improper had ever gone on between them. Although much of the evidence was circumstantial, the prosecution were able to show traces of blood that had been found on a pair of Dan Keller's trousers and informed the jury that blood had also been discovered on the floor of the Keller's house, along with the remains of clothing that had been burnt in the kitchen stove Daniel Shanks told the courts that on Saturday the 6th of July, Mrs Keller had accused his sister of conducting an intimate relationship with Mr Keller 
when Frederick Shanks questioned Clara about it. Without uttering a word, she rose from the dinner table and left the house. She did not even put on her shoes, and regrettably, she never returned. He added that when he and his brothers went to look for her, they saw Mr. Keller standing in his yard. He looked over and then shouted that if they were looking for Clara, his wife had seen her going down the lane. Daniel Shank said that they went down the lane, but they could not find Clara. He added that as they searched that afternoon, the Keller women stayed inside their house looking out of the windows and that Dan Keller just stood in the front yard. They did not join the search. He said that he saw lamps shining in the Keller property, even after he had gone to bed. He did not sleep very much that night, as he was so worried about his sister, especially as Mrs Keller had said that she would mash Clara's heap if she ever came onto her property again. The defence were quick to point out that on the day the body was discovered, a post-mortem was conducted by two physicians who found no evidence that death had been caused as a result of violence. And the following day, the body was again examined by two different physicians whose findings were the same. In fact, it was not until 12 days had passed that the body was exhumed and another post-mortem was conducted, which concluded that the deceased had suffered from a fractured skull and a broken neck. Clara's mother, Mrs. Elizabeth Shanks, also testified. She told the court how her daughter had told her that Mrs. Keller had treated her coldly. Mrs. Shanks said that when she asked Mrs. Keller why this was, Mrs. Keller said that Clara was too friendly towards her husband. She claimed that when Mrs. Keller repeated this in front of her husband, Mr. Dan Keller did not say anything until Mrs. Keller told him that he must confirm her accusation or make her out to be a liar. Mr. Keller then agreed with his wife. The last time Mrs. Shanks had seen her daughter alive was on the 6th of July, when she abruptly left the house during dinner and Mrs. Shanks was of the opinion that she went to the Keller's house to demand that Mr. Dan Keller tell the truth and confirm that nothing had ever gone on between them. The trial lasted for two weeks, during which time the testimony of nearly 200 witnesses was heard and every day the courtroom was packed. On Thursday the 13th of February 1896, the proceedings ended and the jury was sent out to deliberate. After 22 hours they returned to deliver their verdict. They found all the defendants not guilty. This was met with a cheer from the large crowd. The Keller family embraced and shed tears of joy. After thanking their attorneys for their efforts, they all returned home. Many people still considered that they were responsible for Clara's death, and in the years that followed, they were not treated very well by some of the local community. No one else was ever charged with the murder of beautiful Miss Clara Shanks, and the exact manner in which she met her death on the 6th of July 1895 will forever remain a mystery. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.